<laughs> Rob, how you doing? <laughs> that was <Hello>. hilarious. <laughs> yeah. That was that's that's fantastic. Thank you for for doing those. And uh, how are you up there in Moscow, Idaho? Uh, we're doing great. We're doing great. Yeah, life yeah. is good. How are you, Al? Uh, doing, you know, hanging in there. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Here in California, obviously, there's uh, a lot you know, going on mostly down south in Central Valley. Uh, but the um, mm -hmm. yeah, here in the Santa Cruz County, we're uh, we're doing reasonably well, knock on wood. But, uh, you know, like I was saying at the outset, you know, testing is still um, a, a question mark and it's not uh, very uh, available. And so many uh, people who are uh, potentially at risk, you know, haven't had the opportunity to uh, Go and get tested. So, you know, the idea that we are, you know, out of it is, <laughs> you know, it's not even a, you know, a thing. But we are, um, you know, remain hopeful, and you know, we're plugging away, trying to be disciplined, and you know, hopefully things will turn before too long. How about up there in your neck of the woods? Oh, th I, things are good. I mean, we're, um, you know, health-wise, things are great. You know, we. We're a smaller community. Uh, we've actually done some research on um, the if the social determinants of health are a really big indicator for what regions and places would have um, a higher or lower impact. Um, yep. And those indicators are, are around things like population density, people with preconditions, workplace interactions, um, and and then overall population health, which is generally age. Um, and so. Yep. In our research, we found you know regions like you know, California, um, the West Coast is generally in a lot better shape than what we've seen on the East Coast. I think this has been a much, much more of an East Coast issue than the West Coast issue, given the the social determinants. Um, and a place like Idaho, it just doesn't have the density and the um, the preconditions that other regions do. So we're we're faring well. And it's actually kind of, kind of interesting to me too about the testing is. Um, what, there was a status all we've tested more people in five days than we tested for in four years um, for yeah. other viruses and infectious things. So we we have a little bit of a, um, an heightened awareness. This is probably the most heightened awareness we've ever had of a virus. And so I think it is creating mm -hmm. an, uh, a new psyche that um, that plays on this heavily. So yeah. You know, well, well, good for you. I guess it's a good time to live in uh, a rural uh, area, and it is a beautiful area. I've had the good pleasure of being up there, you know, a couple times, and uh, you all have a fantastic team and have been doing great work for twenty plus years. So, for those who don't know, you want to do a quick introduction of, of MZ sure. and yourself? Yeah, yeah. So, thanks a lot, Alan. You know, MZ is about a twenty-year-old organization, and our focus is to connect people, education, and work using data. Uh, it actually started out uh, by two economists from our respective universities. So we, we live here on the Palouse, where we have the two major land grant universities for um, Idaho and Washington, uh, Washington State University and University of Idaho. And uh, two professors uh, years ago got together via some of the consulting they were doing to help better understand the economic impact and role of education on economies. That necessitated the, the collection of a lot of data um, particularly data on labor markets so that we could understand most most institutions have a, a pretty regional effect, meaning that the people that they serve come from a specific place. Think about a community college or a local university. Most of their students come from uh, a specific geography and then most of them actually stay in that place. So we started mm -hmm. studying that and had to collect a lot of data. And what's happened over the years is that's really transferred into more of a helping organizations look at the big picture around economies. And then I think through the last recession, we saw major companies, big employers, really start to embrace that data to better understand a wide variety of strategic talent acquisition issues. So we've been, we love it, we, we love our work. It was never really super planned out, but we, now we have about 200 plus people working on it. And uh, it's, a, you know, it's a real joy and we, we're happy to help people and it's, it's great to join you. Well, I mean, I, 
I, I just smile when I hear you talk because you know I feel honored to have, like I said, I've been up there a couple times and been at your conference a couple times there in Coeur d'Alene, which uh, obviously I'm sorry I'm going to miss uh, this year. I still haven't played golf and gone up to that, <laughs> that island. But at, at the same time, you, know, you all have taken a very virtuous uh, stance on helping economies, helping individuals. So you're, you're tackling a massive problem around your know, organizational strategy, geographic or, or economic development councils, and and then educational institutions. Can you talk about your systematic you know, approach and what data you actually you know, collect? And that would be obviously a segue into the skills discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the problem that, that I think we have in the market today is a lot of times we see it likened to maybe an Amazon and a Uber or even like an eHarmony kind of problem, right? Where we have two people or we, it's the, the challenge of moving something from one place to another, uh, the challenge of meeting somebody. And when I think about that kind of problem, it makes a lot of sense. So for instance, why can't we just find, why can't people find jobs in better ways? Why can't jobs find the talent they need in better ways? Don't we have all this data? Why can't we just have sort of an Uber or an eHarmony to do that? And I, I think the challenge that we have in the market is that what we're essentially trying to do is align three really distinct planets. Uh, the first being the, the home. You know, your home, the place you grew up, your background, where you came from, the language you have there, the way you interact there is radically different than the way that you interact in the world of business and radically mm. in the language of business and then the, the language of education and training is radically different. So I think the challenge that many of the people in human resources, in education and development, and um, in workforce and economic de development have is their challenge is to actually align those three very distinct planets that often share different languages. So I think we actually see the data problem as more of a language problem and a translation issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you heard me say this, I believe, you know, the beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. It's a Chinese proverb that, that I cite. And that's what I hear you saying when, when you say that is that we're, we're oftentimes talking past each other. And even within HR, yeah. there's legacy language that we resort to. And that might not be appropriate for particularly young people who are growing up today who are seeking jobs or, or hiring managers or those who are writing job descriptions. So do you, what do you see needs to happen to get to uh, a more aligned future state, or is that even a, a healthy ambition? Yeah, I think it's a very healthy ambition. I think it's actually increasingly realistic. So you mentioned, you know, what what kind of data are we talking about? And to do the work um, to connect the circles, you know, you can think about the Venn diagram of connecting people, educational work, and uh, this. The reason it it's working more and more is there's so much data available. Um, underneath all these things, and right? And that's that's both a sort of a blessing and a curse because the huge amount of data, like the, you know, the idea of testing, right? If we test uh, every American, what's well, gonna create a lot of data? And sometimes we, do, we don't really know what to do with it. We don't really know how to make decisions on it. We, it's sometimes, it's, it can be overwhelming. Um, this is the, the curse of knowledge, right? It, 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 too much data, too much information can paralyze you and I think that's one of the problems we have in the market today is what should you do? Well, you know, if you're a young person thinking about work, if you're a, an um, adult, you know, dislocated worker, what should you do? Um, well, the problem is there's too much to consider. There's too many things. And so with the data we're getting, data that comes from the government that helps us understand industries and occupations, data that we get from employers that helps us understand the the job title, the location, the company, and the skill, and then data that we get from people, the people themselves who are actually creating resumes and profiles and, and putting things out there so they can better connect to work. What we're trying to do is use that data to help each one of the organizations we work with make better choices and point in just the right direction. So an example with this of this would be something like, you have, um, well, let's put it in the context of a company. A company will create a lot of job postings, and in the if you think about the job posting creation process, uh, let's say maybe it's a cyber job posting. Well, your tendency, in order to find the right person to match that job posting, 
is to load it up with as many skills and I, concepts as you possibly can with the hope that you'll, you'll find people with those things, right? But what a lot of companies might not realize is the more that you put into that, the more that you then limit your possibility of finding somebody who actually matches those things. So the, the idea, I guess, with data is that you would, you would want to find, it's just, it's almost like the ingredients idea when you're making something. Um, you want just the right amount. And it's very hard to know what the right amount is. And so that's, I think, where the data comes in and can help people. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's a, it's a moving target. Uh, there's yep. adjacencies that might be appropriate because the, the skills might not be in the market yet. So you're looking for people who actually can develop towards that end. Is that part of the That's, openness that you're talking about? Yeah. 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 So we've, um, we've created a, yeah, an open taxonomy and it, it's not really, it's not a taxonomy. It's an, it's just an open, um, data set, which we can share with you all that allows, um, people to explore about 30,000 different skills and apply those to job postings, to resumes, even, even to curriculum. And uh, what, what we're doing constantly is curating skills from all these documents that are created, the, these profiles, these postings, and I think even more and more, um, the curriculum, the learning curriculum that's mm -hmm. out there. And if we, under, if we can curate and pull out some of the key things that companies and people and schools are talking about, that can then be pushed back into other documents. And I, let me mention, mm -hmm. I, I like your comment about the, the sort of the, the skills dilemma. When we think about it, I totally agree with the hard and soft dichotomy. It's a bit of a false dichotomy. Uh, I would say that you know, most postings or most uh, profiles, any, I think even a lot of curriculum now, you, you see the combination of two key characteristics. There's a highly technical um, capability in most of these documents. So it doesn't matter, you know, it's a data science position or a, some sort of curriculum. Um, there's a very highly technical aspect to that, but underneath everything, we were recently looking at some of this and about 100% of all job postings out there mention what we would refer to as a human skill. And mm -hmm. a human skill would be those core foundational elements that pretty much you have to have. And that's generally the big three when we talk about human skills, which a lot of, again, refer to as soft skills, uh, are yeah. your ability to be a good communicator, your ability to be a leader or a manager, and your ability to be a critical thinker or a problem solver. Like that's the essence mm -hmm. of, of the, the foundation that need, people need to come with. And if you have that strong foundation, well, technical skills really add on top of it well. So it's, it's not mm -hmm. so much an and or, it's both and. Yeah, and we take and, about that, yeah. Yeah, you know, thank you for sharing that. Just to play it back, you are actually synthesizing all the language that's actually being used out there. So, mm -hmm. and yeah, you know, that's obviously very good because then you can play to what's actually being used. Did I hear that correctly? Yes. Okay. So then it invites the question. If there are biases in the language or if there are shortcomings in the language, then that could potentially present a problem, yes, but it could also present an opportunity to create some uniqueness in your job posting or offering. And let me give you a, a, an example to comment on. Like growth mindset, you know, Carol Dweck has been a, a linchpin in how Microsoft shifted their culture and they've been very public about it. Uh, and many are saying, well, you know, you come in with a certain set of skills to do a certain set of job or a certain set of um, things in, within a job, and then that's gonna shift you know, quickly. And, and so you're going to have to adapt. You're going to have to have agility. So can and should we be better assessing and looking for people who are, uh, have the growth mindset, that willingness and capacity to learn and take action on that learning? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Well, I think uh, if, we, if we think about the world of work, the the key element we continue to see, and I think as we have more technology and this is the automation kind of conversation, it's really pushing back on the importance of the human skill. And the human skill issue is the thing that allows people to do exactly what you said. 
right? Mm -hmm. If you have, um, this is why I think in some cases you'll see more and more companies, you know, almost prefer the liberal arts type graduate, you know, the philosopher, mm -hmm. the, the, the person who's really well versed at communication because there's a sort of flexibility and adaptability in that person. And that's, there's a person there who can learn new things. So I, I think that's, it's vital. Um, but again, I do keep coming back to, you know, the pitfall of the, the human skill, you know, if you're really good on human skills and you lack those technical things, it, it can be a struggle and then vice versa. If you're a, if you're really well versed in some sort of programming, programming language, but you're not ready to give, stand up and give a presentation to your team, that's also a problem. So it's, we, you know, the challenge is, is it's the both and strategy. You know. Right. And I, yeah. in and terms of like the, the bias in the data too, uh, what's what I think I wouldn't say it's so much bias is when people are signaling and they don't know quite how to signal it. That's mm -hmm. actually not too bad, because the more mm -hmm. that we can understand the data, the more that people it doesn't matter if it's a hiring manager or a person or a school, even if the data isn't as clean and, and good yet. The more that people can start to use it, there starts, there starts to become a natural refining process. So let's say yeah. all the cybersecurity job postings today are just bloated and too full of skills. Well, through many interactions and through the way the market behaves, those job postings are going to get more and more refined through time. And the more that we can surface the actual language to people to help them optimize their approach, I think it's, it's going to happen. You know, it's, it's sort of we go from this wild west approach to a more refined, cleaned up approach, and the data helps us do that. Yeah, I mean that, that makes sense. And so, at the end of it, you mentioned your open skills, yeah, database. Yeah. So, yeah, to bring this in a very kind of tactical, practical place, how are organizations specifically, because again, I know you work with educational institutions and economic development boards and things like that, but organizations, yeah, how are they using the skill data set you know, right now? Yeah. Can you give me an yeah. example or two? Yeah, yeah. So the way that, I think the best way to think about our the Open Skills Initiative is we, we've seen really th the problem with three key documents, the job posting, the resume, and the, the curriculum, you know, the program document. So I'd say a company today is using our, our open skills taxonomy to essentially when they're looking at creating job postings, they can start to tag and almost uh, preview their job postings. Let me see if I can share it with you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, uh, yep. Let's see. Can you see it okay? So this is the best yep. way, you know, for me to show you is um, we can actually go ahead and we could take a job posting, for instance. So this is a full stack web developer. And what we can start to do is we can just throw this job posting in uh, to our open skills framework. And what it does is it starts to extract the key skills that you're listing. And all of a sudden, what we could do is we could look at something like a programming language like HTML5 and see we're listing it, and then also see here's other related skills that we might want to think about including. Uh, we can take some of these skills out, we can add different ones in, um, we can understand context for that, we can start to define it a little bit more clearly. And really what, what it's doing is it's it, at first it's extracting, but then it's also giving us other words and terms that we might consider using um, to improve it. Um, so one I think that's a, I think that's the first thing that we've seen companies do is essentially uh, get the language, add their posting, and then start to extract key skills from it. The second thing is this idea of optimization, right? So we could do another example here where we have a person who has worked in a call center, and let's say this person wants to maybe work in a marketing role, um, you know, marketing coordinator of some sort. What this is able to do is look at the key skills that this person has and then look at the key skills of a marketing coordinator and then say, here's the ones that really sort of, these are the key skills that you have that overlap. So there's two overlapping skill sets. There's a few relevant skill sets. They somewhat overlap. Here's three skills that don't overlap. 
And then here's some opportunities for skills that this person should consider going and getting. And that's going to be through some sort of LP or training. So I think that's, again, what we're, we're working to do is really make better connections between these documents. If we can improve the document that an employer is creating, if we can improve the document that a person is creating, well, that, that helps facilitate better matching, much like the eHarmony problem, better matching between a person and an employer. So I think that's, I mean, that's really the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Now, who would be the user in that scenario? And is, leading question two, who else would be using it? it would that be a, uh, a recruiter or a hiring manager in that scenario? It, would it go to the employee level in any case uh, to, so they can formulate their own development plans? It, what, how, yeah. What's the user look like? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's all of the above. I, one of the things is I think we've seen happen most strategically is Probably at the highest level, we see more companies want to work with us to help use us to evaluate their existing job postings and their existing job titles. Um, mm -hmm. You know, let's say you've been a company going, you know, 100 miles per hour for the past, you know, 10 years. And you've been growing like crazy. Uh, it's been a rare thing for companies to stop and say, hey, let's really evaluate our job titles. Let's really evaluate the postings we're putting out there. Um, and I think that's this era of lockdown has really helped a lot of HR groups say, hey, let's pause for a second and just take a deeper look at what we've been doing. You know, I'll, I'll, the executives aren't traveling as much. We can all sit down and talk about these things. So I think this first thing, we've been brought in to help evaluate the job titles and the job postings of companies. Then when you get down to more of the, the, you know, the micro level or the application level is you can start to then like a hiring manager could actually take one of the roles they're looking at. Maybe that role was given to them by three or four engineers that are desperate to find a new person. And maybe it's somebody in marketing uh, you know, or sales role. They can take the description that those teams give them and start to evaluate it from a skills point of view. And one of the things we'd mm -hmm. like to do from an optimization point, point of view is say, okay, you gave me a, ba a basket of uh, you know, a description that includes 80 skills. And it's going to cost essentially $300,000 to fill that. But if we change this, this, and this, we can back that out. We can see way more candidates and it's going to be a much more affordable posting for us to fill. So I think that's, that's the key thing, a, a strategic evaluation of the title and the posting strategy, and then, and then refinement of that individual posting. On the flip side, what we can do is also help that individual know the skills of the role so they know how to match themselves to it more clearly. And this is the classic ATS problem, right? This is mm -hmm. the, uh, you yeah. know, your own employees get rejected when they apply for the job at your company, right? Because right. they don't know how to say so. So you're, in my view, uh, if you saw in the first segment when I talk about the workforce planning model, yeah. We as organizations, when we formulate talent strategies, we need to be clear on who we're looking for so we can accurately create these job descriptions and put them out in the market. And what I heard you say is that this big reset, to use Josh Burson's term, um, which I echo, it's a great opportunity to reevaluate your jobs and the appropriateness of those titles. It could inform org design. And in turn, as you potentially restructure during this period and come out of whenever that, whatever that looks like, we can be more focused and intelligent and not you know, have the same risks that we would otherwise have if we did not uh, use this type of approach. Is that an accurate yeah. way to think about it? Absolutely. Yep. And we've been talking, to, you know, Josh is great, but talking to him quite a bit about this. And yeah, it, what, it, what it does is it renders your, your approach a lot more effective. You know, could you do this without this type of data? Yeah. I mean, we have been for a long time. What I think it does is it helps make what you do so much more effective and a lot quicker. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, instead of sort of poking around in the dark saying, you know, if we put out these ads, you know, if we, if we go and start recruiting these people, uh, if, you, if you have better insight and data on the front end of that process, you're going to be a lot more targeted. And honestly, it's just a lot more effective. It's going to be quicker. And um, yeah. 
and you're going to well, find the yeah, people. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of you and what you all have been doing up there. So as we start to wrap up, I know you're doing some research that's uh, forthcoming on resilient skills. Can you speak to that? Yeah. 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 So uh, the idea of resilient skills and resiliency is, uh, you know, it's a big topic these days. Uh, think about it is uh, resilient things, resilient people, resilient organizations, resilient places. They tend to do well no matter what. Right. If it's a rainy day or a sunny day, they're, they're going to be OK. So we want to look at those those types of skills that are uh, classically resilient in the market no matter what. And uh, I think what, you know, no surprises on this one that, you know, to me, the first thing is what we've already talked about is the human skill is so resilient. Um, why? Because it's super flexible and it's super uh, adaptable. And again, that goes back to those key the people who have strong communication, strong leadership and management, strong critical thinking and problem solving. Um, so that, to me, that was the first one. That, that stuff shows up in basically 100% 100 of job, all job postings, something like that's in there. Uh, the second is the, uh, the, no surprise is also the tech skills continue to just thrive. Um, as we live online, as we practice uh, everything we do through software. I, the common question I get is, what's the next tech hub? You know, what's the next big tech city? It's like, well, they all are. You know, what's the next big thing? It's like, well, you know, hospitals are tech, manufacturing is tech, business is tech. And so the demand for those types of skills is sort of all encompassing everywhere from Moscow, Idaho to, you know, Oakland, California. It's, you know, it's big in demand. Um, I'd say the third thing here is, the thing that people probably underestimate in the resilient, you know, skills area is the importance of, of the, the classic business skills. Um, if you're making software, if you're, you, if you have a tech team that's creating these great services and, and products, what do you need right when you've sort of started making that product or service? Well, you need people to sell it. You need people to serve it. You need people to human resource it. You need people who can, you know, understand the finances. So the, I would say a lot of times we think way too much about the tech skill and a little bit less about those really key roles that help companies survive and thrive, which is the, the sales roles, the finance roles, the service roles, the marketing roles, and so many skills related to that. It's massive. It's a huge sector. So those are, those are all very resilient. Well, I look forward to that uh, piece of research. So how can people learn about that when it comes out as well as you? Yeah, um, uh, I think we're most probably active on something like LinkedIn. So you can look up MZ on, on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow us at MZ Data um, on Twitter. Um, and then you can go to our website, economicmodeling.com, where we serve up all those updates as well. All right. Well, hey, Rob, always great to connect with you. Glad you're doing well up there in uh, Moscow and uh, look forward to talking and hopefully seeing you again in person before too long. I know this Absolutely. is going to be the medium for the time being, but uh, yeah. congratulations on all you've achieved and be well, yeah? Yeah, thanks so much, Al. It would be great to see you again soon, too. Likewise. All right. See ya.